You boys be quiet down there! Welcome. Today we're going to be installing some useful mods on my brother Stirat's spare NES. Now, you'll notice that this system is in kind of rough shape. It's actually a beater that he had laying around that we made a makeshift modification to as kids. We wanted to be able to play taller import carts like Esper Dream 2 or Madara here. So we actually cut some plastic off the front to allow the cartridge to be pushed down. We'll see if there's anything we can do to fix that. But first of all, we'll be installing the NES RGB board. This is the essential board for getting your NES or Famicom to output an RGB signal, made by Tim Worthington. Now, I can already hear some of you in the comments section saying, Hey, the title of this video is Ultimate NES Mod. If it's so ultimate, Shouldn't this system have an HDMI mod instead of RGB? Well, Kevtris did an amazing job on the high-def NES board. It will take a pure digital signal from your NES and convert it to 1080p with lots of great bells and whistles. But the decision between RGB and HDMI comes down to what the console is going to be used for. If the only system you need to be able to play on your HD flat screen is an NES, then sure, go for the high-def NES. It's going to be fantastic. The problem begins when you start to introduce other consoles into the mix. Pretty soon you're doing expensive mods and drilling HDMI holes on all your systems. And since I like to keep my consoles as stock as possible, I'd rather not get into drilling holes in everything. RGB is the language of retro consoles. To play all your consoles on a flat screen in 1080p, there's the one-time cost of an upscaler like the Framemeister or an OSSC, and you're good to go. Plus, if you want to use a good old lag-free CRT, then HDMI isn't going to do you any good. So for this mod, we'll be sticking to good old pure RGB, so this NES can measure up to what the Sega Master System could already do out of the box. In case you're wondering what kind of connector I'm planning on adding to the console to output RGB, I'm going to be using a good old SNES-style Nintendo Multi-AV Out connector. I know I said I like to keep my consoles as stock as possible, but in this case, to output RGB, we have no choice. We have to add something to the outside of the console, and the multi-AV out is probably the most unobtrusive option. At least it's an official connector that Nintendo consoles already use, and the RGB and AV cables that we already have will be able to work with this system. I will not be adding a palette switch because I don't want to drill any extra holes in this unit. Next, we'll be installing the Blinking Light Win. This is a 72-pin cartridge connector replacement that's going to make it much easier for games to load on the first try. No more blowing on carts and hoping for the best. Your saliva is bad for your games anyway. And finally, I'll be performing an expansion audio mod to this unit. Japanese cartridges sometimes contain chips that added extra channels of audio to the Famicom's five existing audio channels. This was possible because there was a pin on the cartridge connector that allowed the extra audio to pass through to the system. When the international version of the Famicom, the NES, was conceived, the audio pass-through pin was not included in the cartridge connector, so this capability was removed. That's why Japanese games such as Castlevania 3 and the Famicom Disk System have different sounds than their overseas counterparts. We're going to be adding that capability back to this system so we can hear the extra audio. The music you're hearing now and throughout this video is all Famicom music that utilizes the expansion audio. This mod will also require a quick modification to the 60-pin to 72-pin adapter used to play Japanese games on an NES. We'll need to add one wire to make sure the converter passes that pin that carries the extra audio through to the console. Well, looks like we've got everything we need, so let's get started. Help me, help me, stew rat. Why have you forsaken me? Relax, NES. We'll do our best to get you fixed up. In fact, you'll be way better than ever when you're done. Meh, okay. Okay, let's get started. First of all, we need to get this thing open so we can access the parts that we need to work on. Just removing the metal shielding here. Now we need to remove the original cartridge tray. This is going to get replaced with the blinking light win later in the video.
Ah, there we go. Here's the PPU video processor chip. This is the chip that we need to remove in order to install the NES RGB. Okay, now to get started with the tough job of desoldering. This is the part that really makes this mod difficult. I can't caution you enough, if you've never desoldered anything before, this is not the project to start with. This is really something where it's easy to mess it up and ruin your system. So if you think this mod looks like fun to do, um, I really suggest practicing desoldering something else first. And above all, get decent equipment. Don't use just a cheap desoldering bulb from the electronics store. You really need to get decent grade equipment for this, and it can be an investment. We have this Aoyu, I'm not sure if that's how you say it. It costs about $150, so it's kind of on the lower end, but this makes the job a lot easier, and I always let my wife do the desoldering because as I've said in a previous video, she is much steadier than I am, and I don't trust myself to do this without ruining the system. So. Standard disclaimer, attempt this at your own risk. I do not recommend trying it unless you know what you're doing. Here's that PPU chip now fully and cleanly removed. Okay, so the PPU is out. We've got this 40 pin socket that's going to go on the motherboard in the PPU's place. This is where the NES RGB is eventually going to sit. So, we need to solder this 40 pin socket in first. Okay, here is that awesome soldering footage that you all tuned in for. Okay, now that the socket is in, I've got my bag of goodies here that came with the NES RGB. I need to put two of these 20 pin headers here into the socket. And the reason you put these two headers in first is because you want all the pins to line up perfectly when you go to add the NES RGB. So you solder this while the pins are actually sitting in here so you get just the right pitch and angle that you want so you can easily put this together when it's done. Here's that beautiful fresh new NES RGB board from Tim. Okay, by popular demand, more footage of soldering 40 pins. You should always solder the four corners first to make sure things aren't moving around while you're working on it. This time we're soldering those two 20 pin headers to the actual NES RGB board. Now that it's all soldered in and cooled, we need to remove this from the board. I always use a small flathead screwdriver. You want to do this very carefully so that you don't break any of your solder joints. I always apply a thin coating of flux so that the solder flows to where I need it to go. I don't add flux to the pins themselves because I don't want the solder flowing up the pins and away from the board. Okay, it's finally time to take that PPU that we removed from the NES and put that in the NES RGB board. Now as careful as we were desoldering, we still managed to lose one of the legs of the PPU. So that's what that extra wire hanging off is doing. We're going to have to patch that one leg through. Now I'm soldering the PPU to the NES RGB. 
Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to put another 40 pin socket here for the PPU. That's because when you do a front loader NES install, there isn't enough room for the NES RGB and a socket and the PPU inside of the chassis. So unlike an NES top loader install where you would do a 40 pin socket for the PPU which makes things way cleaner and easier, we're going to need to solder the PPU directly to the board this time so we're going to have to make sure everything is perfect here. Now I've put the NES RGB board in place on the NES motherboard. Keep in mind this may not look straight from this angle but that's because I've got this big heat sink on the side propping everything up. First I'm going to solder jumper J5 because this is an NTSC NES. If you have a PAL NES you'll need to solder jumpers J4 and J7 instead. Now since I won't be cluttering up the outside of this system with a palette switch, I'll need to bridge pin 3 and ground up here where the palette switch would normally connect. This will keep the natural palette selected at all times which is what you're going to want. Sometimes it can be difficult to get liquefied solder to stick together when you want it to. There we go, got it. The NES RGB kit comes with a little voltage regulator board. You won't need this piece if you're installing on a top loader. I've connected this to the 7805 voltage regulator inside the NES. It's usually a good idea to use thicker cables for the main power supply lines inside of a system. If you want to use correct colors, then you should use black for ground and red for 5 volt, but I don't have black so I'm just using red for everything. Shame on me. Now I'm wiring up all the outputs from the NES RGB board, which will run to that multi-AV output jack. We need to connect composite video, audio, S-video, and RGB because the multi-AV output can handle all of these. Conveniently, the NES RGB outputs C-Sync, which is what we're going to use because the cables we have for Super Nintendo and Nintendo 64 use C-Sync, which is what you want to have if possible. Again, I'm doing everything the same color here, so I'm going to try to do my best to keep track of everything and not build a rat's nest of wires inside of the system. No promises, though. So in case it wasn't obvious already, definitely don't ask me to mod a system for you. You don't want me to. Other people can do a cleaner job. This is purely for my own amusement, and hopefully we'll get a working system for Sturad in the end. Okay, stepping away from the motherboard for a bit, we want to remove this sticker from the back of the system which labels the output ports. I've tried to figure out the best place to mount the AV port on the back of the NES, and Yerky, who is the US distributor for this board, came up with what I think is definitely the right place. If we want to mount the jack here as others have done, there isn't quite enough room to keep this sticker where it is. Now, I mentioned already that I want to keep this system as stock as possible, so I think Surat would appreciate it if we can keep the sticker, but we're going to have to move it up a little bit in order to do that. So, we're going to try to remove this sticker as carefully as we can without damaging it, with the hopes of being able to relocate the sticker slightly higher on the back of the unit. We've employed the hair dryer on the high setting here to try to remove the sticker. And here we go. We'll have to save this sticker for later. Now it's time to cut the hole in the case for the multi-AB output. For clean results, I always like to use a Dremel tool. We've already traced out the shape that we'd like on the inside of the plastic. We start by drilling holes using the Dremel tool. Now we cut it out. We use a combination of different bits, including the sanding bits, to get a nice smooth finish. At the ending we even use a nail file to smooth things out. And here's the finished product. Looks pretty good to me. Okay, now I'm preparing to wire up the multi-AV output. The mess on my soldering mat is flux. By the way, you can buy these multi-AV outports from retrofixes.com. 
I didn't buy the custom made ports they sell because they were out of stock. This one appears to have come from a real SNES system. Aw, oh, poor SNES. I wonder what happened to it. Okay, now we're back at the NES motherboard again. We're going to start wiring up those nice NES RGB outputs to the multi-AV output jack. You can easily find a pinout guide for the Nintendo multi-out online. We need to grab the audio off of the NES's stock audio circuit. This is because when we go to do the expansion audio mod, it's going to buzz if we use the audio circuit from the NES RGB. I'm also hooking up the NES RGB's composite video signal to the AV out jacks on the side of the NES. This way the AV out ports on the side of the NES will still work. Okay, everything is all wired up. By the way, the cartridge connector on the motherboard was looking a little dirty, so I thought I'd take some Deoxit D5 contact cleaner and clean it up a little before installing the blinking light win. Now here's the blinking light win. The nice thing about the NES 72 pin connector is that there's no soldering involved, so anyone can replace it. I've also gone ahead and disabled the NES 10 lockout chip. I did this by cutting pin 4 and tying it to ground. The extra crud you see on the chip here is just flux. Now the NES power light won't blink anymore when it doesn't make good contact with the cart. I actually didn't even need to do this part since the blinking light win automatically disables the NES 10 chip when you install it. I've just gone ahead and done it here anyway for good measure. Now it's time for the expansion audio mod. Expansion audio from flashcarts is too quiet, not to mention inaccurate. So if you're planning to use a flashcart with this mod, then you'll need to use a different resistor value than I am. Since I plan to use this system with real carts, I'm taking some advice from this Famicom disk system thread and soldering a 100 kilo ohm resistor followed by a 1 microfarad capacitor connecting pin 9 to pin 3 of the NES expansion port. And that seems to have gotten the volume levels about right on the first try. Thank you Famicom World folks! Now as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, we're going to need to do a minor modification to the converter as well if we want to be able to use the expansion audio mod with games. So let's go ahead and pop open this converter. We'll start by soldering up a wire to pin 46 of the Famicom side of the converter. We're looking at the opposite side of the converter now. Now that we have a wire running from pin 46 of the Famicom side, we can connect that to pin 54 of the NES side of the converter. Now what most people seem to do is they run a wire from pin 46 of the Famicom side to pin 18 of the NES side. Now of course that's easier because it's closer, but the reason I'm not going to do that is because pin 54 of the NES side has become pretty standard as the expansion audio pin in the NES development community, so I'd like this system to be as standard as possible and to operate with everything, even though I have to run a wire from one side of the converter to the other side now. But it looks like I have space inside of this converter case anyway. Here's what the finished product looks like all put back together. It's really not the end of the world having that extra wire in there. I've already gone ahead and captured footage from the unfinished system before doing the expansion audio mod. So what you're about to see is before and after footage of Akumajo Densetsu, aka Castlevania 3, followed by Madara. Notice how in these Konami games most of the percussion and accompanying harmonies are handled by the stock NES sound chip, while the melody and bass are played by the VRC6 chip in the cartridge, so those instruments will be absent in the before footage.
And to finish up, we're finally going to secure this multi-AV port in place. I think most modders tend to use screws or bolts to secure the connector in place, but that would be visible on the outside of the system. And again, I'm trying to keep this console looking as stock as possible. So I've opted to simply secure it in place with hot glue. For better or for worse, hot glue has become my go-to solution these days to put ports in place when there's nothing to secure them to. As long as you glue the right amount in the right areas, the results tend to be pretty solid, as long as people don't get crazy when using the console. I use a hair dryer on the cool setting to harden the glue faster. The main trick is to make sure everything is exactly where you want it to be before the glue hardens. Looks like we're ready to seal it up. I'll put the blinking light wind back on and secure that voltage regulator to the outside of the metal shielding. Well, here we have the finished product. I ended up sourcing a new top shell in decent condition from a broken system on eBay. I managed to repair that console as well, and it's going back on eBay. I've reapplied the sticker on the back, which looks a bit worse for wear, but fortunately there was space for it. The finished product looks pretty good if I do say so myself, so now let's take it over to Stewrat's house and see what he thinks of his new NES. Oh, shiny, new, I've been given a new lease on life. Okay, so totaling up the cost for this project, the NES RGB cost $79, that was 99 Australian dollars at the exchange rate of the time when I purchased it, the blinking light win was $30, and we needed that Nintendo style multi-out port, so we paid $19 for that, bringing the total cost for this project to $128. The expansion audio mod just took a resistor and a capacitor, which I had plenty of on hand, so the cost of those was negligible. Now, don't forget I had to pay $18 to ship all this stuff. Plus, if you don't already have them, you're going to pay at least $50 for a working NES these days. More than that for one in good condition. You'll need about $25 if you want a converter to play Japanese games. Okay, we're here at Stirat's house this evening to give him back his NES. Alright, Stirat, so this is your new NES. What do you think? Looks about the same as before. I don't know. Oh. Yep, so front of the converter is always up, game always down because the the pin layout in NES and Famicom is opposite. The new converter, put it in now. Don't push it down, just put it you just push it <laughs> push it straight in. Is it weird? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that awkward? Okay, let's try it out and see if it starts right up. Awesome. So you've got you've got your expansion audio. Yep. Try another game now that we're upstairs with the CRT. What game are you putting in there, Stuart? S for Dream 2. Alright, S for Dream 2 on the S video. Okay, S for Dream 2, this is your S video now. Thanks, do that. Yeah, it looks really nice and sharp. Compared to your composite before? Oh, yeah. Okay, so now that the NES is finished, there's only one thing left to do. What's that? It's time to celebrate. Is this just the same beer footage from your Secret of Mana 2 video again? Yes. Yes, it is.
This video has been a presentation of Basement Brothers. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on social media to keep up on all the classic gaming series and features the three of us produce on our channel. We'll see you in the next video.